Great. I'm super excited to teach this class because if I could go back in time and, and learn what we're going to share today, I would certainly do it. Having a full understanding of fundraising would have changed the trajectory of my businesses in life, quite frankly, for the better. As you can see, the, the title for this presentation is Fundraising, an overview for early stage startups. Also, I couldn't resist putting Don't Believe the Hype as the subtitle. Does anyone know where that phrase comes from? You can chime in or you can drop it in the chat. Does anyone know? I'm curious. Maybe I'm going beyond. No one. Wow. Interesting. And I'll proceed. <laughs> so uh, don't believe the hype. Oh, I see Matt. Matt <laughs> chiming in. Yes, you get the prize for today. It is a phrase popularized by the rap group Public Enemy in 1988, which featured Chuck D and the famous or infamous Flava Flav. And actually the song relates to political issues at the time, but this interesting fact, I did not know until yesterday. So there's a connection to MIT. Chuck D, the co-founder of Public Enemy stated that his lyrics for the song were inspired by Noam Chomsky who taught where? MIT. <laughs> so uh, that was a pretty cool coincidence to find out yesterday. Uh, so I was on to something, and now you know there's a connection between Public Enemy and MIT. So simply, I was, was going to say that, Kevin. I just didn't want to show everybody else up. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> wow, of course, Jim. <laughs> the goat. <laughs> the goat. I was searching for an entrepreneurship reference. I was like, well, do, well, you know, when did Steve Jobs say that or something? And, and like, I knew the Public Enemy song. I was like, oh, maybe he's just referring to that. And so I threw it in the chat. <laughs> it completely surprised me, but now I could legitimize the inclusion of don't believe the hype in fact if i were as technically you know apt as i thought i was i would actually play a little bit of the song but we have uh, plenty of time later for that um but basically the phrase don't believe the hype captures my feeling about fundraising and you'll understand why as we go through today's session so quick activity on a scale from one to ten ten being the most excited how excited are you about the subject fundraising? In other words, um, you know, just download. Let us know how you think about it. Drop it in the chat. Uh, don't be ch uh, shy. 10. All right. <laughs> 11. <laughs> Melinda, no fear. 100. Zero. <laughs> well, I, I imagine, and you're going to share with us a little later about this, Costa, but you just closed the Series A. Let's everyone give them... A hand clap, applause, that's a big deal. And, and um, very soon you'll be able to share a little bit about that. 15, nine, eight, thanks. So well, pretty good. Um, I do compare what you put in the chat uh, to the effort on your homework. So we'll see if there's a correlation. Anyway. And the, ti and, and, and the timing, the timing <laughs> and the turnaround. We'll talk right, about that. the timing and the turnaround. Yeah. I decided to use a simple outline for this presentation based on who, what, where, when, why, how, and then finally, there are some do's and don'ts. Uh, also, I made sure to address those topics that you mentioned at the end of last week's class uh, that you wanted to learn more about. And so at any time, feel free to jump in and, and ask a question. Uh, moreover, I wanted to say that this session may run long, and that's okay. There's so much that we could cover here. In fact, we could go all day about fundraising. Um, but Josh and I want to make sure that we make the most efficient use of our time uh, re regarding this topic. There's such a variety of experience among the lecturers that's super valuable. And we'll get to that. I'll start off with my background. You know a little bit already about my story. I'll condense it into two minutes or less and then allow Kim, Costa, Jim, and Joshua to uh, add briefly their fundraising experiences. And please keep it short if you can. I'm gonna try and keep it to two minutes. And Josh, if you can go last, I think that would be great because then you can go right into the next slide yeah. uh, that, that you'll cover. So around 1999, I started a software company that created a content management system for websites. 
It was called Omni Publisher. And it predated WordPress by about two years. It was long before Squarespace and others. We were ahead of our time, but couldn't raise any money. Uh, no one, uh, well, either no one uh, followed our narrative or maybe we were just that bad at trying to convey <laughs> the narrative and the opportunity uh, down the line. And sometimes, you know, you can be too early to your, your own detriment. Um, it's unfortunate, but it does happen. So we couldn't raise much money and I eventually sold it. I know someone had mentioned the last class um, wanting to learn about a fire sale. I, I have a little bit of experience with that. We'll talk perhaps about that later. In 2010, I worked with the Ariel Southeast Angel Partners uh, sourcing deal, deals. Interestingly, the president of that angel group was a Sloney. Uh, apparently many retired executives from Boston moved to Savannah, Georgia and Hilton Head, South Carolina. And they basically got bored and decided to form an angel group there for the area. Uh, in 2012, my good friend became president of the Atlanta Technology Angels. So I became, a, a, that's when my long-term relationship started with the ATA. Uh, in 2013, uh, I closed a major deal with my company, Johnson Media, and I began to invest more in companies um, and into real estate properties. And then most recently, I founded Kinetic and an associated fund to help entrepreneurs find funding, the right funding. And so far, uh, we launched about a, a month ago, uh, $2.9 million have been raised on that platform by members um, and huge uh, big start. So we're, we're super excited about that. Uh, in the picture there, you actually can see uh, at the bottom, Seth Levine, who is a partner of Brad Feld, an MIT alumnus. Uh, and they're both partners at Foundry Group. Both Seth and Brad have been really helpful with Kinetic. So that's a little about, about my entrepreneurial life and how it relates to funding. Uh, so I'll pass it on to Kim, Jim, Costa, and, and Josh, um, if you'd like anything to share. Mine is short and sweet. <laughs> I um, most of my fundraising has been in the nonprofit world. So, uh, on in the profit side, I have usually been responsible for putting a lot of the decks together. But I'm not. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't been out there doing it. So I think this is why I'm not teaching the class. But I've done um, tons of nonprofit and the success in nonprofit. We just started a. I started a nonprofit called the Women's Foundation of Boston about four years ago, and I have two co-founders and. Um, we noticed that there was less than 1% of total major gifts going to any initiatives with women and girls. And so our goal has been to shift that funding just to educate people about, um, so, you know, we have such a laser sharp value prop that when we approach people, it's a, it's a no brainer and people literally give us money hand over fist because of this. We just illuminate the problem. We show them where the money is going and we say, this is how we're gonna grant this to these. And we grant it out and we become strategic partners with the, the uh, women and girls nonprofits, anything from Girls on the Run to the Girls Club to um, the Ron Burton Training Village for STEM, STEM initiatives. So anyway, so that, that's been my experience. Thanks, great. All right, I'll, I'll try to be super quick. So, um, you know, my, my first couple of businesses were completely bootstrapped. Uh, they were funded by my entire uh, um, savings from my retirement account and then uh, my overdraft protection on my checking account when I realized that building out an office was not what uh, a construction uh, what a construction budget was um, we then developed a title title company um, in, in multiple states uh, also bootstrapped but everyone wanted to invest in it um, we sold a very tiny sliver to a PE firm for like six or seven percent of the company it was a good experience in that they had no operational control whatsoever, no board seat. They got a quarterly check stapled to a financial statement and then a K-1 at the end of the year, also great. Uh, now building, um, building a technology company has been completely a very different experience. I can tell you that um, even despite the success that we had closing our Series A last week, um, it is the hands down the thing that I hate most about what I do today. I love hiring people, building, having a hand in product, compliance, all that stuff, but raising money is not fun. I know that some people hate it in some sort of sick and twisted way, but um, it's, it's, 
it takes a lot of time, it requires a lot of attention. Uh, raising money for us has not been difficult. It's been raising money from the people that we want to have on our cap table. And uh, I think it's important to appreciate, I'm sure Kevin's gonna get into this, that um, this, is no, this is not about just you being interviewed. You need to also do your due diligence on who is, who is investing. Uh, and a lot of times they're happy to give you names of companies and founders that they've backed that have done well. And I always tell uh, my students and founders to also get names of people that they have backed that have not done well or have struggled or have had to fold or have had challenges um, because that's where you really learn about people. So, all right, that's it. Back to hey. you, Kev. <laughs> oh, wait, Jim. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> yeah, so I've been around this for a while, as you know. Um, I uh, started out in a company called PTC, which went public while I was there, uh, although I wasn't part of the IPO process. Um, but I spent a bunch of time there and became uh, a very senior operator in a public company. So I've got a lot of public company experience at that time. Um, obviously, raising money from public investors is a, is a whole different conversation. Um, left PTC and we, we raised a, a, a Series B uh, at Indeca. We raised a Series C at Indeca um, from, from traditional venture sources, Bessemer Venture Partners and folks like that. Um, that we took, I, I was the CEO at Natiza or the president at Natiza when we took that public in 2007. So we raised a couple hundred million dollars in the public markets at that time. And then we ran that as a public company. Um, and then I've done a lot since Natiza um, with, with private uh, venture based investing. Um, we did one company called Symbotic, which is a warehouse automation robotics company that was entirely privately funded which is a whole different source of funding that was it was funded by an individual who uh had the resources to you know invest you know, a couple hundred million dollars into the development of that business uh, personally so um, that's a that's a different category of funding altogether um, comes with its own challenges <laughs> in many respects and then it, and then I've spent a lot of time now in in venture so uh, I was um, working with OpenView as a venture partner OpenView is a Boston based firm that does mostly series B uh, SaaS B2B investing and now I work at General Catalyst um, as an executive in residence where they do anything from seed stage hatches all the way to you know take privates and and SPACs. Uh, and so I'm, I'm in the middle of that game a lot. So most of my perspective you'll hear today is going to be really from the, the venture community and that path of fundraising, which uh, I think we will talk about alternative sources to venture, which is a, uh, an important topic to cover. And I would just add one last, uh, you know, sort of personal observation on this topic. Um, nobody likes it. Um, we talk about you know, you're not ready to raise capital. We're going to give you, you know, we're going to push back hard when people say, you know, we're out to raise money. But I will tell you in the technology uh, venture backed capital world, um, one observation I will share with you is that the people who are best at raising capital uh, tend to do really well. And in many cases, it's at, uh, you know, that skill set can be at the expense of great operational skills. And so, um, you know, if you just look around at, you know, some of the, the venture back companies that have made it and you look at their founders and you look at their various fundraisers, you just see that the entrepreneur uh, or entrepreneurial team uh, was really good at raising capital. And this is in traditional venture sense. Um, and raising capital at, you know, at, at high valuations and raising fairly significant amounts of money. Um, and, and I think that in a lot of the very competitive markets that, you know, these tech companies play in, um, that capital becomes a really necessary piece of the equation um, for investing and go to market, investing in, in, um, in product, but, but also um, it sort of gets these companies on the radar, right? And I have lots of examples I can share later, but uh, I just want to plant that seed because I don't want this fundraising thing to come off as, you know, like that dirty little thing we all have to do, but hate. It's really important 
And so um, there's a lot of evidence out there that shows the best fundraisers actually have the most success in building large and successful companies. Great. Hey, Jim, can I have a quick question? Do you, do you, rec do you see any um, uh, commonalities and backgrounds of people that are the most successful? Is it marketing it, sales? Is it, what is it? Is it at raising capital? Yeah. Sales. Um, yes, definitely. Yeah. I think, I, well, I think sales, I mean, I would actually argue that people who grow up through sale in uh, again, perspective for me, tech, tech, lots of SaaS, B2B tech, right? That's where I live. Um, and, and so in that world, I would, I actually would suggest that oftentimes people who come up to the sales ranks are, are not the best at building those companies because they don't generally tend to have the sort of product experience and product background that's necessary to build, you know, a database company that appeals to the development community, right? It's a, you really have to be able to speak the language. Um, and so a lot of times these, these people who are sort of the best fundraisers, um, they deeply understand their markets and, and they know how to sell, right? I mean, and their, their, their passion comes through their, you know, their, their, level of uh, deep knowledge of their industry comes through, their deep understanding of their product and why it will create value comes through. And then they're just relentless, right? And they will not compromise. They will not accept, you know, anything other than absolute perfection. Um, I, I think about a guy, the guy who founded Indeca, Steve Papa, he was an unbelievable fundraiser. I mean, we had not a great story but he was a great fundraiser. Professionally, he had been a product guy at Teradata, right? But he also had an MBA. He was super smart, you know, Princeton undergrad, Harvard MBA, blah, 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 super smart, capable guy um, who, who really deeply believed in his vision for the company. And he would accept nothing other than um, other people who, you know, would sort of go along with that. And he, great persuasive, um, great persuasive, uh, reasoning skills right he could be very persuasive with logic and data to the point where he was just he was just undeniably right because it was the impression he created right so a lot of it came down not so much to his professional background but to his skill set right and um and he, he was very very good at it yeah i i think don't misunderstand me when, when i say sales i mean that person who like myself, and I'm think, looking through my own lens, who started off coding, for example, or started with product, like you said, Jim, but was able to make that link or that leap rather, and be so convincing because they understand that product or service so well that they can sell it and, and translate that knowledge into fundraising. And so uh, for me, that was a huge leap, but I think those um, that can do it do it really well and are at the top of the game. Another example, I know you mentioned Teradata, which is here in Atlanta, um, is Okta, right? Yeah. We've got a great yep. MIT alum. I mean, he's great. He's one of those that made that that leap and is is really convincing. So um, great comments. Yeah, I think it's sales as a skill set, Kevin. I think that's the way I'd say it, right? It's not, yeah. not, not necessarily sales as a profession. Yeah, sales, not like the sales, sales guy. It's yeah. <laughs> not going to work. Yeah, or she. <laughs> yeah not, not, to, not to people who grew up through the sales organization. Right. And not to say that doesn't work, um, but I've seen, and again, in tech, B2B tech, right? So I gotta, you got to keep my frame in mind. Um, the people I've seen who've grown up through the sales ranks, including out of PTC, I mean, you know, for those of you who've heard of the Medic framework or the MedPick framework, which is now like this sort of globally deployed sales go-to-market framework, we invented that at PTC. One day in a whiteboard, wow. you know, that thing happened there. PTC had one of the best, you know, sales organizations uh, in tech. I mean, it was us and Sun at the time. And so we produced a lot of people that grew up through the sales organization. <clears throat> Almost all of them have failed as CEOs and founders, right? Notable exception, Brian Halligan. He's done really, really well, of course, at HubSpot. Um, yeah. but most of them have failed because of this sort of product piece, you know, this sort of product and market piece, but the people who developed selling skills, who understood product technology markets, you know, they did really, really well. So yeah, I think that's a good way to say it. Yeah. Agreed. The only thing I would add is that, uh, you don't have to like it and you can still be good at it, right? The two things are not directly correlated. Um, and so just because the process is painful, it doesn't mean that you're not good at it. Yeah. 
and, and keep in mind that, you know, to Jim's point, uh, it is very hard to build, you know, large, scalable tech, you know, SaaS, B2B enterprise companies without a tremendous amount of capital. It's just, that's just the reality. It's not, you can't bootstrap some of the stuff that, you know, um, uh, that we're talking about. So Not anymore. Not anymore. Used to be able to. Back in my day. <laughs> back in my day. Okay, so. Kevin, back to you before we hijack your session. Oh, no, it's, it's over to Josh now. Take it yeah. away. Yeah, and so, so quickly to finish that up and we'll jump into the slides. So for context of the group, um, my background, I was a private equity investor for eight years or so, uh, then went and built, launched, and, and helped lead a uh, strategic investment fund um, for a Fortune 10 organization then turned around and did the same thing with another Fortune 200 organization. So I've built and led uh, multiple strategic investment funds as well as built th and scaled three kind of corporate backed businesses. So <clears throat> just kind of tying this all together with all the experiences you heard here, I, and I would say I still invest, I stepped away from the strategic fund I led um, and I still do invest. Actually, uh, you know, my PhD research has been focused more on human machine collaboration and platform uh, business models. So with Eric Brynjolfs and Jeff Parker, uh, the guys that created the economic theory on platform uh, businesses years ago, um, I do a lot of platform invest, technology and, and digital platform uh, investing still. Um, and and so the, the point there is just when you when you round this all out, you know, you have uh, you have uh, traditional and strategic, and you have all of us who've invested kind of from the earliest stages all the way through the private equity LBO stages, right? Um, so it spans pretty far. And I, you know, I know there'll probably be some questions on even the strategic side. And I would say um, I'm one of those people who's led two strategic funds. And I would, you know, I'll let I'll let others soften the blow on this one, but I would say stay away from it, right? And we'll we'll, we'll talk about some of that in a bit. Um, but jumping into the slides uh, in, in the material for the day, you know, take a look at this slide. Uh, Kevin's had it up for a moment, um, but these are some of the questions we asked you, right? Which groups are fundraising? Um, and, the, and take a look at some of your peers, right? For the most part, most of you are not yet fundraising. Um, a few of you are. We even see one that has a fundraising consultant, which we're going to, we're probably going to, we're, we're going to give some feedback on that. Um, maybe some things to watch out before you, before you do that. Um, is but, cinematic but, here, by the way? We were going to pick on them. So yeah, maybe we they didn't cinematic? show up. I think they finally <laughs> I'm showed here, up. I'm here. Yeah, I, don't, oh, right. I don't think that is. I'm not sure. I'm okay. not sure I mean, either. Well you, may, well, you may get picked on alone today, so we apologize. <laughs> but, but it'll be, uh, it'll be all That's good. That's fine. I have it's fits, yeah. yeah. Um, but this just, to level set, this gives you, this gives you kind of a, a view of, of how kind of your peers uh, are are, are thinking about this and, and the big takeaway that we're going to kind of lead into. And if Kevin, if you want to flip the next slide, is just like you see on this slide, it, it's very uh, important when you start out to understand and, and to have a methodical process around this to, to determine who and will be responsible um, for this as you start to get into um, the fundraising process. Got it. And then yeah. on the what? Oh, Kevin, do you want to jump in on this one? Yeah, I'll jump in. It and, and feel free, again, to jump in. Um, we've got a plethora of experience. But in general, the person who should be raising that fund, um, that round, that next round, is the CEO, the leader of, of the company. Of course, you can have support and help. But who, at the end of the day, um, will um, be that CEO and, and that leader? Very rarely have I seen someone else completely take up that responsibility. So let's move on to what, uh, what amount do you need? Uh, what are the many funding options? And, and you know, some of you mentioned that you want to know how much you should raise. That's an important question that new entrepreneurs ask. I would pose a few questions to you to consider before we proceed. First, what type of business do you want to run? And what is the business's potential? Related to that, uh, is the business high growth or low growth? Based on the answers to those questions, you know, you'll take different paths, which affect how much and how you raise. Be because all of you expect high growth, I think most of you do, correct me if I'm wrong, and are most likely uh, on the innovation-driven entrepreneurship path of, of hockey stick growth, 
you know, we'll focus on that. We'll focus on, on high growth. So the most popular approach based on what I've seen is the milestone and time-based fundraising. For example, uh, Volar may have a milestone of getting to 10,000 members by the end of the year. They could then back into the amount that they need to raise now based on the resources needed to reach that particular milestone like salaries, advertising, uh, what else, development, and, and so on. So that's one way that you can back into determining how much you need to raise. Also, you can uh, look to see what similar companies are raising, though I wouldn't recommend that you do that for uh, external uh, situations. I mean, this is primarily an internal uh, metric to see what, what others are getting. And this is just to give you an idea of what the market is bearing. You can use Crunchbase. I know some of you are very familiar with Crunchbase and other sites to look up that data. And finally, you'll want to consider if you're going to raise subsequent rounds and how that might affect your approach. So if you don't take anything else away from today's session, I want you to learn this. There are over 125 ways to fund your business. We, quite honestly, over-index on venture capital. I recently had a conversation with the VP of Entrepreneurship at the Kauffman Foundation, and we discussed uh, the foundation's new research, at least 83%, 83% of entrepreneurs do not receive either venture capital or a bank loan, 83%. And that leaves them worse off compared to their peers who are able to tap into those capital markets. And that's just fascinating to me. And quite frankly, one of the reasons why I started Kinetic. The best way to fund your business is via customers. And uh, the video that Josh is queuing up will um, help you understand this. And it's Bill Allett himself, who is not necessarily anti-VC, but more pro-bootstrapping. And here he is talking about the importance of customers and his experience with pursuing vendor financing, uh, particularly from Honda. So if you could take over, Joshua, queue up that YouTube video um, from a recent kinetic conference, then you'll hear it directly from Bill himself. Real quickly here, I, this, is, this is what I tell my students all the time, is the number one source for you to get revenue is, your, uh, is, is, is um, funding you're overlooking, and, and, and they almost all do. It's very simple, it's called the customer. Go to the customer and get them to pay you for it. If you get them to prepay you for it, by the way, it might be easier than going out and raising money. It might be less. In, it, it'll, if you do it, you're going to be on target for what you need. It will make it easier to raise money the next round. You will raise money at a higher valuation. It blows my mind how obsessed my students get with, I need to go raise venture capital before they have gone to customers and got them to commit. It is not as hard as you might think. I got over a million dollars from Honda to do this, and we didn't have anything. We didn't say we didn't fake it that we had it. We said, here's what we here's what we'll build if you if you give us a third of a million dollars up front and you give us a third halfway through and then you can pay at the end. And oh, by the way, we'll give you a discount. Nothing can be less uh, less expensive for you than doing that. Give them a damn discount. When you raise money through equity, it's really expensive. It gets you off focus. Now, don't do this unless that customer is one that represents the bigger market. But it just blows my mind that people overlook this. The first place you should try, go to the customer, get them to prepay you. If they really think your product is good, they will pay you up front for it and you can give away some, you know, well, well, we'll give you, for us, for Honda, it was a six month exclusive. We couldn't work with any other automotive manufacturer for six months. We were giving the sleeves off our vest. So I could go on and on about that. So I wanted to, to play that because uh, you know, it's Bill. <laughs> so I'll let Bill speak for himself and um, entertain you in, in only um, the way that he can with that New York City flair. Um, but I think for you all, uh, you know, drop in the chat or feel free to jump in. What, what do you take from that? I mean, has your focus been on the customer or thinking about raising funds? All right, let me. Um, 
So we had a strategic partnership funding answer from, from Sheffy. Then Eigen said it, they're exploring the idea of cost plus discount for their first pilot program. And then I believe, yeah, taxi. So Haley said <clears throat> they're focused more on financing their fleet uh, plus charging stations. Inside, maybe we can jump in and explain what we, what we plan to do to, to get our customers to eventually pay us is mostly getting our hardware for free, right? And, and make it a no brainer for them to, to buy into our solution. Problem there is that you still need money to raise to get the hardware, right? So we are in a chicken egg kind of loop there, but uh, maybe you can comment on it. Yeah, no, that's some really good comments. Um, it, it can be very difficult to focus on the customer, right? Because it, it takes a lot of energy uh, to be able to do that. But ultimately, and I think Bill was, was very adept at saying this, you, you really set yourself up to succeed when you have customers, if you're going to pursue that fundraising. Um, and so, you know, we talked about customers, uh, you can see friends and family there, pursue as much non dilutive capital as you can. And this can be from friends and families grants. Um, and the goal is not to give away equity, because you're lazy and unwilling to exhaust all other avenues first. Debt includes credit cards, bank loans. I know when I first started out, uh, I opened a credit card and that was very helpful to me and allowed me to maintain a lot of equity. And there are more obscure ways. Again, you heard Bill talk about vendor financing. That's perhaps a, a little bit more formal uh, term to refer to what he was talking about and what he did with, with Honda. Love that, have used that quite successfully. And there's also revenue-based financing. In fact, ClearBank out of Canada and Silicon Valley Bank have teamed up to offer more of this type of funding. Shopify has a revenue-based program too. And basically investors inject capital into a business in return for a fixed percentage of ongoing gross revenue. And that payment increases and decreases based on your business revenue. So, and that's typically measured as either daily revenue or monthly revenue. And it, it works really well in, with, with retail, which is why um, uh, Shopify has been very, very, very successful at that. And then finally, there's equity, which includes venture capital. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that soon. Uh, and quite a, a few of us have experience in venture capital. But first, I want to delve into something that's become increasingly popular. Uh, I want to introduce equity crowdfunding. Raise your hand or you know, drop in the chat if you're considering or have considered equity crowdfunding. And can anyone explain what that is? Would anyone like to volunteer? I see no takers. So no one's considered <laughs> equity crowdfunding. Oh, sure. I, I, I wrote in there. I just, it's just after a previous uh, answer. So it looks like it wasn't uh, adding to this, but yeah, no, that's uh, we're, we're definitely considering that both for the uh, demonstration film and for the company itself. So how did you come to that determination? Talk, talk to us a so little bit about I that. I grew very familiar. So after uh, my film came out on Amazon, I did, I did a lot of like film festivals and TV festivals. And so I became very familiar with it for film fundraising through that and through talking to like entertainment lawyers and things like, uh, and people like that who highly recommended it as sort of the wave of the future after uh, the Obama administration's jobs act in 2012, um, right. it became a lot more uh, po popular and a lot uh, more beneficial for entrepreneurs. Um, and then it resurfaced when we were talking to uh, different people uh, in the Cinemagic process about alternatives to venture capital for something like Cinemagic that might have sort of a popular uh, type appeal. Um, because of the sort of uh, setsiness of the business, if you will. And so uh, that's sort of how we came to it. Great. Well, it, as I mentioned, it's becoming increasingly popular. You mentioned the Jobs Act um, under uh, President Obama that really opened up the opportunities and democratized investing. And we'll talk a little bit about accredited and non-accredited investors a little later. But no, that's great. I think it's a really great avenue uh, to pursue to fundraise. And a lot of people do it in addition to other traditional, more traditional ways. Uh, and for those of you that are new to it, it's essentially uh, the online offering 
of private company securities to a group of people for investment. And the great thing is that you don't have to be wealthy to, to participate. Popular forums like Republic, a division of AngelList, and Start Engine, which you see here, are popular crowd equity platforms. And so the minimum investment can be as small as 150 bucks. I think for this particular campaign, it's $250.25. It's interesting to see the 25 cents there. Um, but quite a few MIT entrepreneurs are on these platforms as both and, uh, investors and entrepreneurs. So it's, it's something to consider. So the, the web page that you see in front of you is actually my friend's campaign, Popcom. And Don Dixon, the founder, is the first woman to raise over $1 million in a secure token offering. She's a funding pro. She's done everything from loans, grants, competitions, uh, revenue-based financing, and it's, it's great personally to see her progress. And, and she told me this, uh, she actually told me that she was gonna pursue equity crowdfunding in 2016 at a business conference. And she's just been the GOAT in terms of um, equity crowdfunding, um, especially with secure token offering. Um, you know, when the Jobs Act came. So I wanted to uh, play a clip from Dawn, just giving some general advice, because uh, she is really good. She's my go-to person when I have fundraising questions, especially as it relates to equity crowdfunding. So here's a clip, uh, the last clip uh, that Josh is gonna queue up that um, is a, a part of a, one of the panels that we did on early stage funding. One of the best I've ever heard. So I encourage you to go back and watch it all because there are a lot of jewels that, um, that they give during that panel. Um, and here's a three minute segment. So it's a, it's a little long, but it's really good. And I really wanted you to hear directly from Dawn about her experience. And so this is Jared, an, an MIT alum who's actually fundraising on Republic right now. He's um, uh, in that initial period. So go ahead, take it away, Josh. You got it. Are any of you fundraising currently? Okay, so Don, you're, you're fundraising currently. Can, can we uh, hear a little bit more about how that's going and what that process looks like? Yeah, um, I'm on my third equity crowdfunding campaign. So I raised the maximum in 2019, 2020, and then I, we just reached 1.3 million last week. We're doing a Reg A Plus, which is essentially like the institutional VCs version of a, a, a series A, we can accept money from crowdfunding and institutional. So we're fundraising and getting follow on capital from our current investors. Um, and then we're reaching to new to new investors. So we've, we're about at 4.5 million total raised right now. And then we have another 3 million to go in our round. So once we close this round, we'll be at about 8 million raised. And then we'll, you know, look to another round at the end of the year. That's kind of how it always goes. You're always either fundraising or planning for the next fundraise. But if anyone's right. interested in checking it out, it's at startengine.com forward slash popcom. And then I also have an open round for my, I have two companies right now, two VC backed companies worth in the millions. And the other one is called Flat Out of Heels. And that's also on Start Engine as well. So, so it's my understanding um, that the, the rules around equity crowdfunding recently changed to where the maximum you could raise in a given year was a million seventy thousand, and that's increased up to five million, I, I think. Um, yeah, that's in the Reg CF. So the Reg exactly. CF is um, it's just the 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 base crowdfunding. It was a million seventy, now it's five million, and then the Reg A Plus, which I'm doing, it was fifty million, now it's seventy five million. Okay, and and I guess the question I want to ask you is, how do you think about you know, you're raising from institutional investors as well as raising from, you know, the crowd. And, you you know, you talked a little bit about before about, you know, democratizing the investment and access. You know, how do you think about weighing though that the, the money that's coming in now when you think about you've kind of got both of these levers that you can pull on? Um, yeah, so I've raised over a million from uh, venture capital and accredited angels. And as I said, of course, three million in Crowdfunding also won about 250,000 in pitch competitions. I went through Techstars Accelerator. So for me, it's just, I weigh it by um, the, the need at the moment. And also when it comes to taking VC money, I don't spread my net wide. I'm very specific. I only pitched about 30 investors to close my million dollar round because I was very intentional about studying these investors to understand if their um, investment thesis aligned with what my company was doing and if they had any portfolio companies that were 
similar or any LPs or um, managing, you know, managing partners that could really help my, you know, my company grow. And so now that we're in the stage we are at, we're really looking for strong venture partners. So I won't just take money from anyone. They have to really be someone that I want to deal with for years. And just to, to share why it's so important, I had to buy out two investors last year because they just were sitting on my cap table and they weren't contributing. And so I didn't want them there. So I'm very intentional and deliberate about who I give equity to from my company. So one of the things that I took away from that, and, and I hope you all caught it, is that she was very deliberate about who she wanted on your cap on her cap table, right? And what did she what did she have to do to two of the investors on her cap table? Who caught it? Who was listening? Fire them out. Yes, essentially she had to fire them, <laughs> right? And she said if because they weren't adding any value, that she you know bought them out so that that really speaks to making sure that the people on your cap table are you know bringing bringing value um, and that's super important and we'll talk we'll go into more detail of how you do that and be very deliberate about uh, making sure that you've got the right people on your cap table um so, kevin before sure, we ahead. proceed i have a quick question on on crowdfunding yeah. Um, so when you're doing crowdfunding, like you can typically get, you know, hundreds of investors for like a smaller amount. How does that affect your cap table going f like further? <laughs> you know, so when you're raising, let's say you do a pre-seed for that and then you try to do a seed or a series A, my understanding is then it's, it's kind of a mess trying to uh, raise money further on. So kind of what, what's your perspective on that? I think you're right spot on. I mean, if as an investor, um, a partner, if I see 100, 200 people on the cap table coming from, a, a, you know, an equity crowdfunding um, round or raise, that makes me a little skittish. Well, not a little, but a lot skittish. I mean, uh, from the entrepreneur's perspective, that's, that's a lot. You have to um, communicate with them. There's a lot of regulations, uh, uh, but the platforms help with that, Republic, as well as um, seed engine. I mean, they, they provide those intermediary uh, services that you'll need to be compliant. But in general, to answer your question, yes, that makes me very reluctant to, or more reluctant to pursue a deal if that cap table has so many other people um, from an equity crowdfunding raise. And feel free if, if anyone else wants to chime in about that. I So I spent a couple of years at Carta which does cap table management software. And we would charge people so much money for, so we would charge based off of the line items on a cap table. So whenever people came in, they'd raise a nominal amount of money and they had tons of entities on our cap table. We would be like, yikes, um, pay through the nose for, for this service. Uh, and our competitors were the same way. So, so not only is it more ex expensive in, in many ways, but you also have to consider the persona of the investor. And what I've heard from a lot of people, including Dawn, is that sometimes when you're taking smaller investments, you have to deal with a lot more drama, so to speak. Those investors uh, are the ones that are emailing you um, and really don't understand the time horizon. And they might be investing a larger portion of their income. So they're a little bit more anxious about the whole situation. And, you know, you really have to be communicative and talk to those type of investors a little bit more. So great, great question, great point. Um, again, great panel. I'll drop the link in the chat so that you can check that out. Two others on that panel just graduated from MIT and raised 2.6 million for their company last month and uh, they share how they did it. Super excited for them. I helped them close their, their seed around. Uh, they're doing operations for or uh, dynamic pricing for restaurants. Really brilliant guys. So let's dive a little bit more into venture capital. And again, I encourage my, my co-lecturers to jump in. Uh, this chart displays the typical valuation ranges. We won't get into the specifics of this table. What I really want you to pay attention to is the round size in the top row and who participates in the bottom row. Since most of you are very early, 
you'll be raising anywhere between 150,000 to 750,000. And these are certainly not fixed in stone and are based on statistics that really don't take into account other factors. For example, uh, underrepresented founders, which I'm passionate about, receive on average one third of what others receive during their friends and family round, according to the Kauffman Foundation. So, you know, it, it varies. Nevertheless, this chart is, is helpful. It, it helps you really understand the blurred divisions between stages of venture capital. And, and years ago, and Jim may be able to speak to this, so many different delineations didn't exist. But as we've moved forward and the industry has become more developed, there, there are definitely more um, types of uh, venture capital. Um, and some would call it adventure capital. Uh, so most of you, again, will be seeking angels and pre-seed VCs. You'll see at the bottom, again, that bottom row who participates. So who are these angels? Well, I'll tell you a little bit more about them. Most of them are former entrepreneurs who missed the excitement of launching a business. Many have launched their own companies, made significant money, and now they want to help younger entrepreneurs achieve success. That's certainly the case with me and how I feel. Demographically, angels tend to be middle-aged white males, though this is changing. More and more angels from diverse backgrounds are becoming more prevalent and prominent. They've been investing for about 10 years and are about 55 years old. 90% have college degrees and more than uh, half hold a graduate degree. And if they are in an angel group, then they make about one or two investments per year. And it's important to note that there are accredited angels, we mentioned that term before, and non-accredited angels. And, and you know the accredited angels meet the Securities and Exchange Commission requirements. And those are basically um, requirements that help to protect investors from losing money. Um, I, I don't know, are you all familiar with accredited and non-accredited investors? I see some heads, no, no. Okay. Um, but so the accredited angels, you've got to have an earned income that exceeds 200,000 or 300,000 together with a spouse in each of the prior two years and, and reasonably expect, uh, expect the same for the current year. Or you have to have a net worth, I think it's over a million dollars, either alone or together with a spouse. Um, and that doesn't include your, your primary residence or your house. So moving along, um, there are individual angels and groups of angels. And we'll focus on the groups. That's my experience. And I think it's most beneficial to you because when you're pitching to a group of angels, um, it increases your odds versus going from individual to individual to individual. And so there, there might be individuals who invest, but um, I would say it's more difficult or tedious to go one by one. And so there are many benefits to, to a group. You don't have to work as hard and you can benefit from the collective wisdom of that group and so on. Uh, you as an entrepreneur, you can pitch many people at once. And some examples are uh, the Atlanta Technology Angels I mentioned before. There's the Boston Harbor Angels and HBS Angels of Boston. And as you're putting together your prospect list, you know, you'll be able to add to that list these angel groups to maximize your efficiency. So uh, another example, the Atlanta Technology Angels fluctuates between mm, or around 100 members, members or so, uh, give or take a few, few dozen every so year. And so for the, for the pre-seed VCs that you see there in the um, pre-seed round, you'll also want to understand better that particular um, persona. So one thing that I, I suggest that you do as you consider fundraising is to change your perspective, uh, especially when raising VC money. And I saw this in an AWS workshop and I loved it. Uh, basically, it says seed state valuation is not really about what your company's worth. It's really too early to accurately determine this in many cases. It's really about how much equity you can afford to give away while positioning yourself and investors for a really good outcome. And this is super important when raising because most entrepreneurs get carried away focusing on valuation when it really isn't that important yet. Also, you are not asking for money. It might seem that way, but you're really selling a prosperous future, not a pauper's present, as, as I often say. So now Josh will talk a little bit about when you should fundraise, which is um, speaks directly to some of your questions last week. Yeah, and so and so what you see here, guys, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna throw these out here really quickly, and because I think it's just as important. Um, hey, hey to get Josh, 
Can I just yeah. add one comment on Kevin's previous slide? Sorry to interrupt, but before we shift gears, Go for it. I really like this, Kevin. And I think that um, thinking about what you're selling is really important here. So if I'm an angel investor or I'm a seed stage investor, why am I going to do this? Right. And, and so I'm, I'm buying equity from you for sure. You're trying to figure out how much equity you can afford to sell to me and for how much we're trying to negotiate that price. But, but really what I'm buying, I'm actually buying into you. I'm buying into who you are, what your vision is. I'm buying into my confidence in you and I'm, and I'm buying into my desire to help you. Right. And so, so much of this early stage investing it's about the entrepreneur and it's about the relationship the entrepreneur has with, you know, this particular seed stage or angel stage investor, right? Sure. You're selling equity and that's what the transaction looks like, but that's not really what people are buying into, right? They want to be part of, you know, the journey with you. And so remember that when you're selling, I mean, that's really what you're selling, right? You're not just selling, you know, stock in your company or a note that will convert to stock in your company at a later date, right? You're, you're selling the journey, right? That's the, that's the thing that they're buying. So just, uh, just I, I liked how Kevin put this in the context of what the, what the investor is really buying. And, um, and I think that's an important element to think about as well. Thanks. Yeah, that's perfect. And, and I think that's where I wanna go with this uh, quickly is to, to get some of these called simple rules out there and then have Jim Costa Kevin weigh in as well, because, because this is where you, when you think about when you're raising uh, the things you should do when you're, when you're fundraising, you want to get as many of these nuggets as possible. And so you guys obviously have the slides, but what you can see here is, you know, point number one, obviously what we mean by you're either fundraising or not, you know, it's the focus piece, right? It's methodical focus. Um, and, and like we put here, you're fundraising, you're building your company, Wearing both hats can be challenging. Now, there's going to be some different views um, on, on this one, but I'll kind of address those here in a moment. Fundraising full time. This is what Kevin talked about earlier. Um, this process can, is brutal. Costa kind of mentioned that quite a bit. Uh, so the focus and the consistency and that methodical approach can shorten that window quite a bit. Um, talking to investors simultaneously. Look, this goes back to what we've, what we've hit on earlier. Uh, you want to make sure, in what Kevin showed in the video, you want to make sure that the investors you're bringing on board are the right fit. So you want to know what your options are. Um, it can be incredibly exciting, right, um, to, to, to kind of get that first investors, you know, to give you the green light. Um, but, but you, you know, taking in venture investment, um, it's a marriage and, and you're stuck with that person uh, in that group and that fund for a really long time. And so there's times where you're far, far, far better off saying no, walking away and making sure you have the right fit. Um, moving quickly with investors. Uh, this is one of the things for any of you as have taken 15431 with Antoinette and, um, and, and, and Matt, we'll talk about it, right? Um, it is your job to give the investors the information that they want to see, because what you have to think about this in terms of what they're looking for. They want, op, they're investing in optionality to see the experiments you're going to run, the timing and the learnings that you're going to get from those to continue to invest. So you want to make sure that you're giving them the right information, you know, the information they need, but move quickly. Um, and then for yourselves, we talked about this, you know, look for optionality. Now, going back to one of the points, and this is where I'll kind of pause for a moment and then let Jim and others weigh in with their kind of guidance on this is there's that, that tug between focus on fundraising and building your company and always keeping those conversations going simultaneously. Those can seem at odds, um, but, but the reality is that you do have to make sure that you're focused on, your, on building your company, but speaking to and staying engaged with the investor community is different from always fundraising. So just know that it is okay to continue the ongoing dialogue so that when you are ready, you're in a position uh, to, to be able to raise another round. It's hard if you're kind of kickstarting a process, having not you know, had any ongoing dialogue. So just don't confuse those that it's okay to continue dialogue um, and to have that ongoing. A lot of times with the CEO or your CFO, um, 
that that the, that's not counter to focusing on fundraising full time or not. So I'll pause there, Jim, Costa, Kim. Anything you think? Hey, when you're we're fundraising, here's some of the here's some of the about the tricks of the trade or things you you say you really need to focus on outside of these. Well, one of the things I always coach um, CEOs, <clears throat> entrepreneurs who are raising money to do is to time limit it. You know, it's like, it's, I mean, I mean, look, it's, you can't raise full time and do nothing else, right? Let's just be clear, right? I mean, you are still building the company because you can't drop the ball, right? You, you know, if you, if you're running toward a quarterly close of Q1 and you're clowning on this big contract coming in and that slips, you know, that hurts your fundraise, right? So, I mean, you, you have to multitask here. And so the best way to sort of create this focus is to say, I'm going to raise money for you know, X number of days uh, or weeks, and I'm going to be done, right? And try to time bound it and use that time bounding to help you create urgency with the investors, because it's really, really, unless you have a story that people are just crazy about, right? Um, it's really easy for the investor to say, well, we're just going to wait. And we'd, we'd like to see what happens, you know, in the next three months, right? We, we'd just like to wait. Right. And many of you may find yourselves in that situation. And if you can find some ways to create urgency and scarcity value around what you're doing, then you can effectively time bound it. And if you can effectively time bound it, then you can really focus on it and still run the business at the same time. Um, but, but get out of the, get out of the fundraising mode, you know, as sort of quickly as you can. So I think that's one piece of advice I would, I would offer is, um, try not to have this drag out forever. Some, sometimes it's, you can't control it, obviously, but um, anything you can do to create urgency and scarcity value is really going to be important. Yeah, I'll, I'll save my comments for later, but I, I just wanted to chime in and say, you know, um, that timing and, and giving them a deadline is, is so important because they'll string you along, right? Most investors, and I'm, I'm, I've done this myself, I'm a little embarrassed to say, but you know, we don't want to say no because you could be the next big thing, right? So we'll, we'll string you along and give you the W word, wait. Go ahead, Kim. No, I was just going to say, Kevin, I'm, so I'm an, I'm an angel investor in a couple of companies. And uh, the first time I did this, I made a huge mistake by really investing a lot of money in this, this guy who was um, really, he proven entrepreneur. He had two startups in the healthcare space and even it's slow moving, but this one just seemed like foolproof. So now we're up to six up rounds. They're up rounds, they're not down rounds. And um, and every time he puts, he time bounds it. And then he said, hey, by the way, all these like very reputable people are in it. And in order for you to keep hold of your investment, here's how much you would have to invest in every single round. So is, he's creating this urgency of like, oh shit, I, I should probably do that. I should probably do that. So I did a lot of research on should I keep putting more money into this thing? And I decided not to, but every time I see who's in the next round, I'm like, shit, I should have done it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I'm just saying like they, so, but they, that was his seductive way of doing it. Like Peter Lynch is in this round. Like, it, and it's like, you know, um, so I just wanted to know what, what you guys thought about that. Is that something that you see when you're, when, when people are trying to raise money, you're, you're kind of attracting other people by who's in it and how reputable they are and, and that kind of stuff. Absolutely. It's part of creating scarcity value, right? I mean, right. yeah, for you to have an opportunity to invest alongside this person, I mean, when else is that opportunity going to come along in your life, right? So that's absolutely what you're selling. You know, this is part of the, we talked about selling skills as a hallmark of a great fundraiser, right? Great capital raiser. And, and this is an example of that, you know, I mean, these are good selling skills, right? And they're creating you know, something you, <laughs> the Theranos. Track. I know, right? I saw You're that. Great. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you have to, have, you do have to do this with integrity. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, you can't just totally bullshit your way through. Um, no, but I mean, this, this is really an example of it. it's creating something that you might not otherwise be able to access. Right. You mean, yeah. you know, I can invest next to this person. Yeah. Um, and it's also creating urgency, right? Because once you sort of have that momentum, then you can say, yeah, and we're going to close the round next week, right? I mean, it's, we're, we're bringing this to a close. And I've experienced that, a company that I'm an investor in, small, small company in the battery recycling business. I mean, the, the urgency was that they were doing a round with a lot of early stage kind of seed investors, right? And I put a little bit of money into it. Um, and the urgency they were creating was simply, they, they had a, 
fairly large volume by count of investors. And so they just said, we're going to close this next Tuesday. Are you in or not? Right. And it's like, yeah, okay, I guess I got to make a decision. Right. So yeah, I'm in, I'll do it. Right. So just another example of really kind of running the process in a way that creates urgency and yeah. scarcity of value. Right. Yeah. Hmm. That's great. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about scarcity um, just ahead. Um, so um, moving along, and, and Melinda has a great question. We'll definitely get to that. Let me just try and get uh, a little bit further through. And just, the, just let me point out one comment here, Kevin. If, oh, if sure. anyone's wondering, hey, guys, we're kind of at the time um, the, 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 the end time for our next session, like we said up front, we're going to try to stick to that as much as we can, but what we wanted to do is create some flexibility today to make sure that everyone was getting perspective, not just from Kevin, myself, but also Jim Costa and, and Kim live. And so just know that we've kind of built that in. So it may cut off some of the time on the back end, but we thought with all the questions we knew you guys would have, um, that, that you could ask us all kind of live. So keep going, Kevin. I just wanted to, to make sure the group I had context on the timing. Thanks. And and to quickly, we'll come back to this, Melinda, but quickly to address your question in the chat, can we talk about how much equity to give investors? I think that's going pretty deep. The average, I would say, is around 20%. I mean, once you start getting over 20 and 25%, then that's um, giving up a whole lot. So um, I'll, I'll just answer that quickly, but we'll, we'll come back to it uh, at the very end um, and you can get some more perspective on how much equity is, um, I guess, within some reasonable bounds. So here we're looking at where geographically you should raise funds and where you know the funding is going. We have some national stats here. In the upper left-hand corner, we see the gender and ethnicity of CEOs who have been funded. Uh, mere 16% of underrepresented ethnicities received funding. Uh, moreover, a mere 17% of CEOs who received funding were women. And we see that 84% of all funding goes to white CEOs. Unfortunately, uh, I don't have enough time to really dive into deal structures, but I encourage you to receive, um, research you know, more about the common types of deals or terms. You can see on the, the upper right-hand corner. Uh, regarding deals by investment stage in the upper right hand corner. Um, the majority of deals are new and a lesser portion is follow on. In other words, a company that may need additional funds after an initial investment. At the bottom, you can see the percentage deals in each region with the Northwest and Southeast, surprisingly outpacing other regions. And so, you know, this, this graphic is very um, informative and I provide a link at the end where you can see the most up-to-date resources. And it, it'll probably be a little different given the pandemic, but it's really important to see where the money's going and where you might be more successful um, raising funds. So a little bit more about where, we'll, we'll specifically talk about the industry. So this graph gives us an idea of what industries angels are investing in and what they like to invest in. And this data is from 2019 and shows that angels are inclined to invest in information technology, no surprise there, which represents about 29% of all transactions. Next, we have consumer products and services at 25%, healthcare at 20%, and business products and services at 16%. Information technology is actually down from 2019, about 10%. It's a bit shocked to see that financial services is so low, but it actually increased with the growth of, of FinTech. Why? So why should you fundraise? And we'll go through this pretty quickly. This relates to some of the questions that, that you had last week, but I wanna hear from you. So drop in the chat why your company should fundraise. In other words, what would you do with the funds? Some of you may have talked about this already, but I'm curious to know, and I think it would be helpful for all of you to share with your colleagues, you know, why would you fundraise and what you would do with the funds? So go ahead and drop that in the chat. And while you're doing that, um, because again, if you, if you don't know why <laughs> you're fundraising, then you definitely should not be fundraising. So I see Accelerate IT Development, which is a really good one. We'll talk about that. Uh, funding the, the pilot film. I know Cinemagic, Matt and 
Uh, Zach talked about that uh, in our session, so th that's very good there. Um, so here are some some good reasons um, to you know you can build a prototype, acquire resources to enhance productivity, uh, and speed up your efforts. And there there are so many others, but I really wanted to focus on the bad reasons. Uh, there are a lot of bad reasons out there to fundraise. Uh, one of them being to test the viability of your product. That's a bad idea. You should be testing the viability of your product with potential customers, not investors. Uh, also, don't avoid working, you know, or don't fundraise to avoid working on your product or service. Another bad idea. And definitely do not do it to gain publicity. We talked about this, I think, a few classes ago. You know, publicity often does not pan out to customers and benefits. So definitely don't do it to gain publicity. I know it's tempting because the media tend to glorify startups who are closing rounds and that gets a lot of attention, but that's a distraction in, in most cases. So don't get caught up in the zeitgeist and feel that you have to raise because everyone else is. Any VC will tell you that bootstrapping and getting revenue from customers is the way to go and actually makes your prospects, you know, better down the line if you decide to continue raising. Um, also, you know, talking or taking on investors is serious business. As Dawn said in, in her segment, uh, video segment earlier, you don't want just anyone on your capitalization table or cap table for short. Um, they can be, as I often say, an angel or a demon. <laughs> So moving quite along, we're almost almost finished. So how? Um, and I hey, think Kevin, can is, I can I make yeah. one comment on that? Yeah, and it's, jump in. It's on your on your uh, reasons not to do it. Sure. I, I would I would add this um, not as a reason to fundraise uh, because it's not, but there are some benefits of fundraising when you do it for the right reasons. Besides, you know, being able to give yourself a salary for the first time, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, the and one of those benefits is it gives your company credibility, right? And it's, this is a little bit the publicity issue, right? But it gives your company credibility, right? And yes. so one of the things you need as a company is you need credibility to attract customers so that they believe that you're real and that you believe, believe you can deliver what you say you can deliver. Fundraising help is a signal, right? It helps people recognize that. The other, per, the other group that it's a signal to are prospective employees, right? So once you go from your core founding team where you're all in the boat together and you figured out how to divvy up the equity of the business and you've got this great working relationship and you're paying yourselves nothing and it's time to like hire, you know, the first 10 engineers, right? Well, the fact that you have funding is going to help you do that. Not just the obvious mechanics of you can now pay people, but it gives you credibility, right? It gives you yeah. a sense of being a potentially attractive employer, right? And so, um, this is in the this is in the benefits of fundraising that are maybe not as obvious, right? Category. So, just thought I'd mention that. Now, that's a that's a great one, and, and I love the the mention of a salary, right? I think a lot of entrepreneurs make the mistake of thinking that they shouldn't include their salary or payment when they're putting together, you know, how much they should raise. Definitely, and it, it'll fluctuate based on, you know, where you live. If you're in Silicon Valley, it's gonna be a little bit different than if you're in Atlanta, Georgia, for example. So including that salary is super important to be able to grow your business and, and stay afloat. Kevin, what about critical hires? I mean, I know we're gonna talk more about that next week um, in terms of, is that that's what you mean? That's what we're talking about resources, right? Or you, what, Definitely. Do you, what do you think about that? Well, it's somewhat related to making sure that you include paying yourself, right? A lot of times, uh, in fact, I've got a good friend who's raising uh, $5 million right now because the software development team that he hired on a contract basis out of Israel um, is just that, they're a contractor. So he's raising money to acquire the company, to acquire the talent because, um, large investors don't like the fact that he's contracted his development to another company. So in his case, you know, he's raising funds to acquire that company, but ultimately the goal is to acquire the talent that's actually, you know, producing the software that he um, is, is, is selling. So I think to your point, yes, that definitely should be included as you move ahead and think. And it may come in subsequent rounds. Early rounds, you're, you're really putting in a lot of sweat equity, uh, doing a lot of the work yourself, uh, especially if you're gifted in, in coding um, and selling. 
Um, but yeah, I think especially down the line as you grow, um, finding that talent and getting the money from investors to bring on that talent or poach that talent is super important. Great, great point. I hope I, I addressed that, I hope that helps. <laughs> Um, so moving on to how, how do you devise a strategy and a plan? I'm going to go rather quickly through this. Um, well, you know, first you need to have that compelling narrative. And I know the taxi team was talking about how they've shifted their narrative as they prepare for, uh, I think, a pitch competition. So many firms actually don't craft a narrative that's strong. And I'll give you three simple uh, steps to follow. Simply explain what you do. I've read so many explanations that are too technical or don't resonate with customers, let alone investors. Keep it simple and not complicated with a lot of, a lot of jargon. Uh, number two, communicate you know, the single thing that's most compelling. It could be your team, uh, the market opportunity, the traction, the milestones that, that you've reached, make it compelling. And then third, you know, outline your progress to date, future milestones and long-term vision. What have you de-risked um, to date? That's a huge one. A lot of investors like to see what you've de-risked. Um, and um, ultimately, what you know, outline what your biggest, biggest risks are. How? Um, a lot here, um, but I'll give you the overview. And again, you'll have these slides so you can go back and, and reference them. So how do you devise a strategy and a plan? Uh, one of the best techniques, and I think Jim referred to this earlier, that I think is most effective is to create scarcity by working backwards from your ideal cap table. And I talked a little bit to Cinemagic about this, but create your ideal cap table and then start filling it in. And you can break it down um, as such. I'll give you an example. So if, if you wanna raise $2 million, then perhaps you can have one lead VC for 800,000, two follow you know, VCs for 600,000 and five angels for 600,000. So you, know, you might uh, map that out, so to speak, um, and be very methodical about who you choose um, for those positions. And again, be very de deliberate and you know, treat it like a sales process somewhat. But you'll wanna have um, three investors for you know, every one in final, in final due diligence um, that, you, you know, that you wanna choose. So that's sort of the, the three one rule there. And also you know, for about every 20 investors that you reach out to, you, you'll probably get around one. Um, and these are these are estimates, but I really wanted you to understand what what you're working with and what the numbers are. Um, also, momentum is super important. Once you get that first check, it's way more likely that the others will come. Uh, and ultimately, no one wants to be that first investor. No one wants to jump in the pool. Um, and also, wanted to let you know that the lead investor is the biggest, so not necessarily the first. So again, you can get those small checks. Um, and ultimately get the bigger one or the lead. Uh, and then also you've got to understand the psyche of the investor. I know I'm going a little fast, but I want to um, finish up here. So, um, all right. So we're going to end with some activities here. I'll, I'll need your attention um, and participation. So again, this is a safe space, safe place. Uh, feel free to drop your, your answers in the chat. So here's the activity uh, to better understand the psyche of the investor um, and to change up the pace. So here we have a fictitious angel investment portfolio. And you know the maximum time that you want to support a company is about 10 years. Many of you know that 10 years is a pretty long time horizon. Ideally, you get a return faster than 10 years. And here we have 10 companies and their names across the top. The red figures represent the investments and the green represents the returns on those investments for each column. Got that? So in general, angel funds um, deal with scale and they must invest in many companies. And so they're looking for, especially at the angel stage, 10 to 20 times their investment, not three times. It's very low. VCs want even more. And so the average return on investment is around three times investment over four years, IRR of 25%. So at the end of the day, the big takeaway is about 7% of deals yield 75% uh, of returns. So 7% yields 75% of returns. So a diverse por portfolio wins. So we're gonna have a little fun. Very simple question, true or false? And feel free to drop it in the chat. True or false, at least, um, actually what I'll do is I'll drop it in the chat. That way you can, Think about the question while you answer it. 
All right, so here's the true or false question. True or false, the least amount invested in a company yielded the highest return and the greatest amount invested in a company yielded the lowest return. I'll give you a few seconds to chime in. It's not that difficult. Just take a look and, and figure it out. Again, true or false, at least or the least amount invested in a company yielded the highest return and the greatest amount invested in a company uh, yielded the lowest return. True or false? Oh, come on, come on, wake up. I, I don't see anything yet. I see trues, okay, and trues. Few more, few more, chime in, chime in. All right, All right. It's, it looks like it's unanimous. <laughs> or, or folks are just like figuring out that um, there is an activity um, and, and jumping on the wagon. <laughs> so cool, I think everyone's chimed in. If not, that's okay. Um, and so, yeah, the answer is true. Uh, Impor Bio received 75,000 in investment funds, but it was a dud. And then YCAM received 10,000 bucks and returned a handsome 600,000. And even though this is fictitious, I really wanted you all to be able to see um, a, a sample investment portfolio as an investor, um, because I think that'll help you better understand the psyche of an investor who ultimately, an angel investor who ultimately might invest in you. So you definitely don't want to be an Impor Bio. You want to be um, an X camp and actually have a really good return on investment. All right, so we'll do uh, one more. This one's a little bit more complicated and I think a little bit more fun. Um, definitely do chime in. So, you know, let, let's look at a capitalization table. Um, some of you may not have seen a cap table. Um, this might be helpful. It shows ownership, equity dilution and value of equity in each round of investment by founders, investors and, and other owners. So let's take a look at the cap table uh, for a minute and I'll just drop two simple questions in there for your fun and entertainment. And then we'll talk about those and, and proceed to, to close it on out and feel free to, to jump, jump right in. So the, the questions are how many angel investors invested in this company? And the second is how much did the angels collectively invest and I must apologize it's not the highest resolution but it should be good enough for you to provide an answer again the questions are in the chat how many angel investors invested in this company and how much did the angels collectively invest if I were a good singer I would sing the Jeopardy song I am not so I won't offend you we've got a couple responses Matt and Haley, they, they are quick. <laughs> We've got uh, four and then 5K, 500, 500K, 500, says Melinda. All right, I'll wait for one more. And feel free to revise your answer. I, I'm, that's a little hint. <laughs> that's a little hint. Take a little closer, perhaps at the price per share. Um, um, but I'll wait for, for one more. To, to come in again. So how many in, angel investors invested in this company and how much did the angels collectively invest? Ah, I see a revision there and a smiley face. All right, all right, great. Way to go, Matt, way to go. Um, so I, I'll, I'll count that as the additional response and uh, I'll move on to give you guys, um, give you the, the answer. So you can see in the red square there that we have four angels and that collectively they invested 500,000 shares at 50 cents per share or $250,000. Um, and I must say, you know, it's unfair. I, I um, aired myself. I should have looked at the price per share. So don't feel so bad, <laughs> but thanks for playing. Very, thanks for playing. Um, let's move on. So uh, I guess one thing I wanted to say about that exercise, you know, once you received your money or investment, you know, a lot of people talk about what happens when the check is in the bank, right? Um, you definitely want to check in with your investors and provide them with peri periodic updates. Do exactly what you said you're going to do with the money. You know, some angels are more involved than others. We talked about that earlier. 
Um, but I think it's important to be proactive in your reporting and try to set a consistent check-in date. Uh, regarding the final exit stage, the goal is to have a successful exit. And most of the time that means a merger or acquisition. Again, an IPO is not very likely, but it is possible. And the general rule for angel investors is this, if you can't get your money out, don't put it in. If there's no exit, then exit. So I just wanted to expose you all to a cap table. Um, if we had time, we'd perhaps go in on a term sheet. Um, if you haven't seen one, and um, you know, I wanted to get you thinking like an angel investor, which is going to be very helpful if and when you raise money. So let's close out with some final do's and don'ts. And I open this up to all the lecturers to, to jump in. These are just some of mine. Uh, and I'll go over these very quickly. Wait as long as you can to take on investors. Avoid it if possible. You know, I, when somebody said, I want to learn how to avoid raising money. <laughs> and so um, that's super important. And it really sets you up um, better in the long term. Learn about terms and the fundraising journey in general. Attend angel and VC meetings as a guest. This is what I used to do. In fact, if you reach out to an angel group, a lot of times they'll have guests. So try and attend and learn from the mistakes of other people pitching. I've seen product demos go awry. I've seen people get caught lying and making up things as they go along because they want to impress. Definitely don't do that. Be sincere. If you don't know the answer to a question, say, I don't know. I will get back to you. That's way better than trying to BS your way through a pitch or a question. Uh, cultivate relationships with trusted investors before you need money. It's sort of that adage that someone told me very early on. Go get a bank loan when you don't need a bank loan. So helpful. Also, don't talk <laughs> about- you can get one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, don't talk about valuation on the first meeting. That's a whole other area. Don't raise too much money. I know, I think it was um, Bernardo, I think who wanted to talk about fundraising failures. Um, at all costs, avoid a down round. You definitely don't want a down round. Um, and a down round is basically when you've raised more capital than you need. And you know you discover that that valuation is lower than it was prior to the previous round of financing. You definitely don't want a down round. And then finally, don't run out of money. Prepare for the future um, uh, and you'll set yourself up to be successful. So with that, I'll end on some quick resources and some final questions. I know we're going um, long. Venture deals, got to support the MIT family. That's a book that's a perennial favorite written by Brad Feld. You can see that there've been many updates and uh, new additions. Uh, some of the content from this presentation comes from the Angel, um, or the book Angel Financing for Entrepreneurs. Uh, I love the Angel Resource Institute. The uh, leader there, Susan Preston, is awesome. She and her group put out a lot of really good information. Um, one thing that I found that's helpful too is the 150 common questions that angels and VCs ask. That is really good. So if you want to prepare for a Q&A for a pitch or just be prepared for any question that might come up, that's a really good list to go through and practice with. And then finally, James Currier, who's um, a really great guy and focuses on platforms. Josh probably knows about, about his work, offers a lot of great resources for platforms. But not only that, they actually created a really nice list of angel investors, uh, a platform for angel investors and entrepreneurs. So check out NFX's or uh, their signal, uh, signal.nfx.com. And it actually you know, divides the angels by industry and category. Quite helpful. So that's all I've got today. I'm sorry for running a, a bit long, but I think this was a great session. I, I appreciate the lectures and I appreciate you all uh, participating in my games and I hope you learned something. So with that, we'll open up for some questions and, and closing comments. I think the only only comment I would I would add is just to think about sort of big picture context, you know, um, and it goes all the way back to the beginning of this lecture, which was excellent, by the way, Kevin. Thank you. Um, which is, you know, funding your company with with revenue, right? Like, what a concept! <laughs> and you know, it's the it's the best funding you can possibly get. And I think I, I raise this point because there is a question that you need to answer for yourselves, which is, do you want to have investors in your company? Because the second you take money from an angel investor or a venture investor or a venture firm, 
you are on a path to a prescribed outcome, right? It, you must create a return for those investors. That's your job, right? That's why you took their money or that's why they gave you their money, right? And so, you know, if you have a different idea about where you'd like to take your business, and I know lots of people who built lots of really interesting companies that they have run themselves for their careers, you know, five, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, and they own the company outright. And as it's grown and as they've needed working capital and financing for working capital, they've used bank loans and things like that. But, but just remember that when you, when you take equity investment, at some point that equity investor expects a return on that capital, which means you have to create liquidity in the equity of your company. How do you do that? You sell it, you take it public, you merge it with another entity, you know, whatever. And that's fine. And that's what a lot of people do. And, you know, people have created some, as you all know, some amazing companies and, you know, they generated wealth and all that stuff. But, uh, but ultimately, if that's not what you want to do, don't take equity financing. Great class, Kevin. Awesome job. And uh, please, like Jim said, reach out with any questions, any follow-up that you guys have. We, uh, we're happy to help. Um, otherwise, have an awesome Tuesday, and we will uh, we will see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.